It's no secret to most of you today that uh, the culture in which our younger people, youth, teenagers, young adults live and operate is overwhelmingly neo-pagan and highly sexualized. My question is, how did it come to be that way? I did some research with a gentleman by the name of Mark Crispin Miller, double name, who's a communications professor at New York University. And I'd like to quote what he says. Often there's a kind of official and systematic rebelliousness that's reflected in media products that are pitched at kids. It's part of the official rock video worldview. It's part of the official advertising worldview that your parents are creeps. Teachers are nerds and idiots. Authority figures are laughable. And no one can really understand kids except corporate sponsors. So can we lay the blame for the situation that I described when I opened here totally at the front door of the corporate sponsors? Can any of the blame be laid at the front door of homes across America? Can any of it be laid at the front door of the churches of America? Bob Juist, who writes for World Net Daily, posted an article back in January of 2004, so several years ago, and the title of the, of the article was Killer Culture, A Call to the Churches. And in that article, he challenged Christian churches with the horrific effects of today's culture, noting that culture is today more devastating on kids than ever before. It's becoming, I think, chillingly clear for us that culture has nothing but evil intentions in this world. The culture. We see it everywhere, and quite frankly, most of us feel quite helpless to even attempt to stop it. I know I do, and I'm sure you do as well. Culture has money. Millions, if not billions of dollars, and people behind it who are pushing their cultural agendas and views. Bob Justin sits, insists that today we are confronting, and again I'll quote, a child molesting culture that is destroying the character and moral core of our nation and has especially targeted our teenagers. Here he raises the question that I'd like to consider. Is he exaggerating when he calls today's culture, and I'll use the term pop culture, a child molester? If you think so, Bob Just believes that, um, or if you don't think so, Bob Just believes that you just have not yet grasped what he calls culture's malevolent power. And then he challenges Christians to consider how you would react to the following situation. And he poses it this way. You come in one day from work, or from where, from wherever you have been, and you have an 11-year-old son at home. And when you walk in, you find an older man who is sitting there showing your 11-year-old son pictures of pornography. How would you feel? How would you react? Bob Juist states that movie companies have been caught testing adult content movies on 11-year-olds. Now, I, don't, I can't verify his, his research, but I won't deny it either. Like you, I am convinced that corrupting influences are everywhere in our culture. Everywhere. And unless you're just some sort of a recluse that never gets out, never watches TV or anything else, you can't avoid it. The average teenager is exposed to thousands upon thousands of sexual images every year. 
Dr. James Dobson, that many people put a lot of trust in, puts it quite bluntly when he says, again, quote, the culture is at war with the parents. The first thing that Christian churches must do is face up to the term that James Dobson uses, and the term he uses to describe this is a war. Now, there are lots of men and women in this congregation this morning who have been to war. And I'm talking about a hot war with guns and ammunition. You've been there. You know what it's like to stand in a battlefield and face the fears. You also know what it's like to imagine what it would be like to lose the war. If you lost the war, you would lose everything you have, everything you know, everything you love and cherish. All of that will change if you lose the war. I don't think it's much of a stretch for us to say that today we're in a war, we're in a battle for the very soul of the United States. And we're talking spiritual warfare. And we're talking a spiritual defeat. And in that realm, the only entity that is competent to respond powerfully and successfully and in the numbers that are necessary to win the victory is the church of Jesus Christ. We're the only ones who can do it. We're the only ones who even want to do it. In congregation, that means you and it means me. It means all of us. Far too long, the church has just sat back and let the culture roll. But the battle is too immense. It's too important for us to neglect. The battle is too immense and it is too intense for Baptists alone to win. If this battle is going to be won for the heart and the souls of America's youth and young people and young adults, it's going to take all Christians, not just us, not just Baptists, but all Christians. And so the question is this, how do we develop a battle plan, a strategy for firing up, if you please, Christian churches to take offense in this furious war of culture? And if you need more motivation than just taking a look at the culture itself, then remember one of the statistics I cited to you last week in the, the message when I cited the, the Barna Research Group that less than one out of four born-again Christians, 23%, accepted Jesus Christ before their 21st birthday. One out of four. Or to give it that more positive interpretation, 77% of all people who come to Jesus do so before they're at the age of 21. Now, those are just percentages. 77% accept Jesus before they're 21. Not to say it can't happen afterwards, but the odds, if you please, are much more in your favor or in the church's favor to try to win people when they are children, teenagers, and young adults. What does that tell you the emphasis should be on? Reaching those people. And there aren't enough of them in this congregation this morning to verify the fact that this church, or most any church, really gives a darn about that. And I wanted to say another word, but I figured you'd get mad at me. It's important that we try to reach those people. Millennials. Remember from last week? The millennials, those born between around 1977, 1995 to 2000. There were more of them born in the year 1989 than in any other year. That means today a millennial born in 1989 is 23, 24 years old. According to the statistics, most of them then are going to be past that prime year of 21. But not everybody is. And so every year among the millennials, 4 million turn the age of 21. 4 million every year. If we listen very carefully to that, by the time that these millennials are 21, you say, well, why, why are they hard to reach after that? Because by the time they're 21, they will have formed personal beliefs and understandings that at least statistically 
they will take to their graves. And if we don't change them and give them that which is positive and give them that which we know is right from Scripture that can make them better people, moral people in this life and then with the Lord in the life to come, by the time they're 21, statistically, we are going to lose that generation. It is vital because they will have already formed that, that pattern, that, that hard shell. And guess what? It just gets worse. It gets harder as the years go by. They get more skeptical as the years go by. If you tried to talk to somebody 65 about Christ who has, nothing to do, has, who has had nothing to do with church, they've got their minds made up. Not to say the Spirit can't, can't do something with that person. But again, statistically, it's awfully, awfully difficult. And so the bottom line is, as the message title states, we have a window to work with. It's a battle for a window. And that window is somewhere within the next five to seven years based on, again, what the millennial ages are and what the statistics tell us. Five to seven years to win the lives of that generation for Christ. And so if this church or any other church is going to do that, when do you think they have to start? Now. Can't wait. You have to start now. In 2 Corinthians chapter 10, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, verses 3, 4, and 5. I normally read from the New American Standard Version, but I want to read this morning from the New Living Translation, so you can follow along, but kind of, kind of hear what the New Living Translation will say. The Apostle Paul wrote, We are human, but we don't wage war with human plans and methods. We use God's mighty weapons, not mere worldly weapons, to knock down the devil's strongholds. With these weapons, we break down every proud argument that keeps people from knowing God. With these weapons, we conquer their rebellious ideas, and we teach them to obey Christ. Now, here's a man who knows what we're going through. And, and the, the reason he does, he begins by saying, look, I'm a human being too. I understand what it's like to be involved in that kind of, of decision and in that kind of action, if you please. But he says clearly, when he takes the battle to people for Jesus, he does not rely on human resources and human weapons. He relies, he says, instead on what he calls God's mighty weapons. And clearly, this apostle believes that it is a war that is going on. Look back to those verses again and scan those for the number of war-related references. He talks about waging war, God's mighty weapons, worldly weapons, the devil's stronghold. Do not think for a moment, congregation, that you are not at a war for the souls and the lives of teenagers and young people out there surrounding this place right now. It is a battle. It is a war. And the battleground, if I understand the text correctly, is what Paul calls the devil's strongholds. That is the only place that term is used in the New Testament. And as it's used here, it refers to a military practice of building strongholds. Or we might use the term forts, fortresses, like Fort Sam Houston, Fort Hood, Fort Bliss. Those kinds of places that are armored and ready for an attack from the outside. This is what he's talking about here. The devil has a fort, and it's fortified. And for us to attack it with our weapons will be disastrous. It must be God's weapons. It is significant then in the very next verse that Paul talks about and writes about knocking down the devil's strongholds. Knocking them down. And he explains what he means by that. He says, we are talking about destroying arguments that keep people from having a knowledge of God. He is not talking about just blasting the devil. 
He is talking about trying to get into the head and the heart of a person who has good reasons for not believing in God. And to say, we come to you with some sort of argument based upon God's weapons, and we can destroy your arguments and win you over to faith. Try to imagine, and and actually you don't have to imagine, a culture in which the culture mocks the fact that the phrase under God was ever put into the Pledge of Allegiance. Under God. One nation under God, which we never say correctly, by the way. There is no comma. One nation under God is the way it should be stated. Not one nation under God. One nation under God. And some people think that's ridiculous. Or consider the motto that we have on our money. In God we trust. Delete that, some would say. Or all of the references that every year we go through for place, events and, and circumstances and buildings where there are nativities out for Christmas. Or crosses put out. Or emblems and logos that depict that in some way. And all of these things need to be removed, people say. I don't have to probably tell you this, but this ain't your grandfather's America. It has changed. And so whatever we do in the next five to seven years is likely to set the pace for what is going to take place in the next 50 to 100 years of church history. Actions we take now will impact generations to come. And there will be a price to pay if we fail to evangelize our children and our children's children. A battle is raging for the hearts and the minds of the millennial generation. Twenties and under. And teenagers especially are being stripped of their morality, their value systems, on a day-to-day basis. Popular media is employing what could ordinarily be described as reasonable arguments for the hearts and the belief systems of the young people whom we love and cherish. And right now, it seems to me as, as, as if they're, they're winning. I know some people don't like to watch TV, and Jenny and I are not crazy about all the shows. We have a select few that we watch. But unfortunately, in between some of those shows, we hear all those stupid commercials. And we kind of look at each other and we go, did somebody hear the pilot for that and go, whoa, that's good, let's put that on. Really? I heard somebody say, yeah, that's right. That's what it is. I, I, don't, I don't get it. And, and it almost seems to me like the shows that people are, are putting on out there makes it appear to be that the teens are invincible and that it's, it's fruitless for us to attempt to even reach out to them. I don't buy that. I, I can't buy that. It is time. In fact, it is past time to sound the alarm as the, the two little the, the title two words battle cry for the past two weeks this week and last week to sound a battle cry and we all need to take part in this war against the decline of morals and the decline of values and the decline of evangelical Christians all the way down as Barna says to about four percent of that category now. How many of you know what MTV is? Oh, I'm not raising my hand. <laughs> Back in the, was it the 80s? When MTV first started? Several of you going, yes. Yeah, I know who you are now. <laughs> that stands for what? Music TV, right? Music television. And they began by, they showed music videos when that was sort of, I should be looking at you. You're the dude that knows all this. MTV, right? Music television, they showed music videos, right? Back in the 80s? 81, 81, okay. (laughs) Now we know. 
Well, I, I decided I would, I, I haven't watched MTV, but I decided I'd go to their website and kind of do some looking on the MTV website. Do you know it's more than music nowadays? Oh, it's a lot more than music. Um, it, it has TV shows. And, and, I, and I wrote down three of them that in case you don't watch MTV, here are some names. The first one, 16 and Pregnant. That's the title. Um, another one called Buck Wild. I, I don't even want to go there. And then there's one called Bam's Unholy Union. And I decided I'd kind of read up a little bit more on Bam. And so MTV gives this little description thing, and it says, is it Magara? Bam Magara? Nobody's going to admit to that one. I don't know who he's talking about. Bam Magara's going to make an honest woman out of his lucky lady and blow the doors off the hallowed halls of matrimony and possibly light them on fire in the process. Some of you are going to want to go home and watch that, I'm sure, just to see. That's MTV. And um, again, I, I don't want to sound like my dad or my grandfather or my preacher when I was a kid, you know, always shook a finger or something like that. Here's what I will say. You can't do much about MTV. You know, I mean, if we're going to live in the United States of America and there's going to be some freedom, we're going to have to put up with some of that stuff. What I will tell you is, just as MTV's influence is so pervasive in culture today, so must the church accept the challenge and let their influence be as if not more pervasive than MTV's. And we have not done it. We haven't done it. So what can we do? And is decline inevitable? Well, again, back to the text. Paul stated that Christians have to use God's mighty weapons to assault Satan's forts, his fortresses. Because our weapons won't work. God's will. He says in verse 5, with these weapons, God's weapons, we break down every proud argument. Did you hear that? There's an argument out there that can be used to keep people, as he says in the, in, the, in the rest of the verse, to keep people from knowing God. You know, in a lot of ways, it's not that people go, nah, I just don't think there is a God. There's a reason why they believe that. Now, you may think it's ridiculous, but there's a reason why they believe that. And our task is to find out what that reason is and try to defeat it, not with our weapons, but with God's. And it can be done. It can be done. And then he says, with these weapons, verse 5, we conquer their rebellious ideas. Conquer. That's another war term. And we teach them to obey Christ. Now, admittedly, some kids do get sucked into the media mind maze, and then they, they manage to escape. And that's good. I'm grateful. But not everyone does. Not everyone escapes. It affects their lives and their behaviors for years to come. Years to come. You say, well, how in the world do you know that? Well, can I go back to, to my generation for a minute? Let me take you back to... 1969, and a, a scene at Max Yasger's homestead at Yasger Road and State Route 17B, west of Bethel, New York. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Woodstock. Woodstock. My band, wo no, wait a minute. <laughs> I was not there. It's too far for my mama to let me go. But a lot of boomers were there. And a lot of their identities are still caught up in Woodstock. They're still Woodstockers. Did you know there's a Woodstock nation out there? 
Woodstock Nation, for all the people who went to Woodstock, who attended that, that festival. And at one time, it had a foundation. I think it's defunct now, but the, the foundation was, the purpose of the foundation was to, quote, secure the 1969 Woodstock site for perpetual free assembly. Now, again, there's nothing wrong with that. You deal with it if you're an American. Freedom is essential for us. You deal with it. My problem is these hippies haven't gotten over that yet. Can I say it this way? Grow up. Cut your hair. Come into the 80s, 90s, the 21st century. Good grief, they're still at Woodstock. Give me Crosby, Stills, Nash, and Young any day. Jimi Hendrix is dead. Janis Joplin's dead. Come on. You say, well, what are you doing? why are you getting so upset about that? Well, I want you to understand that sometimes you cannot think of what's happening to your young people today as just a phase that they're going to grow out of. It can get into their hearts and minds and stay there for 50 years and affect and color everything they believe in for the rest of their lives. And these are the arguments that Paul is talking about here. And do not think your children today, teenagers and even the young people, are not looking for an identity They are looking for an identity. And there is a huge mass media machine that's out there that is eager to give them one. And it has nothing to do with the real world, which is not on MTV. It is, but it ain't the real world. It's not real. If you're a Christian, I would hope that you would want your child and your grandchild and all the others that may come to have a Christian identity where they identify with Christ and center in Him. But you need to know and understand that the culture-centered identity is exactly the opposite. And if we take Paul's word seriously here in this passage, we're going to have to create a battle strategy that will, according to him, break down every proud argument that keeps people from knowing God. It's going to have to conquer their rebellious ideas, and it's going to have to teach them to obey Christ. Piece of cake, right? Easy. Let me take you back to the group from the World War II era. The middle of the 20th century. Before, actually, the middle of the 20th century. There was a group called the Nazis who marched across Europe at lightning speed. The Blitzkrieg conquered nation after nation. And annihilated a good many people along the way. Before long, they occupied France. They occupied lower Europe. They were gearing up for an attack against England. They started with bombing raids. They hit the island nation hard, night after night after night. England pleaded with the United States to get involved. Do something to help us. And we eventually did. But not until... As you builders will remember, it took the enemy blowing up the back door at Pearl Harbor before our warriors were sent forth. This is not about Nazis. It's not about the Japanese. It's not about sneaky attacks. It is to say that we cannot wait until the enemy chalks up a spiritual victory over the millennials before the Christian warriors decide we need to go forth. You can't wait till the battle hits you. Our backs are against the wall. And the media influence on our young people is so powerful that at times it feels useless to even attempt to fight it. I know. I'm, as I put this sermon to, to together and, and thought about what to say to you I, and and. Goodness knows, I'm preaching to myself, too. I'm going, really? What can I do? What can, what, can, what can you do? 
Well, we have to have a battle plan. You have to have a plan first. You cannot just go out there and start doing things willy-nilly. You have to have a plan that will somehow take advantage of this five- to seven-year window that I'm talking about before a huge chunk of those millennials turn 21 or 2 or 3 or 4 and beyond. So what might a battle plan look like to rescue the minds of an entire generation? What will it take to regain the lost ground? Well, we, we can't keep doing what we're doing. Because if if Barna is anywhere near right, a 4% conversion rate is disastrous. And it's just going to get worse. So what is the strategy? Well, I I wish I had that magic spiritual bullet to say, if you'll do this, it will win. All I can say is what Jesus wanted us to do 2,000 years ago, and that is that every single one of us must engage in the battle. Not just your pastor, not just your staff, not just your deacons, every one of us. Never before have the fundamental values that we have for so long embraced uh, in our nation been threatened so directly. And even for those who recognize what is happening around here... We, we don't know sometimes if anything can be done to turn things around. Let's just say, though, that, that it happened. Let's just say that every parent and every grandparent in Cibolo Valley Baptist Church or any other church around, let's say they all got together and they did their part and they won their kids to Christ and their grandkids to Christ. That'd be great, wouldn't it? You can lose or you can win your own family to Christ and still lose the battle. Because your kids are going to marry someone someday. Who will they marry? Who will be their lifelong friends out there? What kind of neighborhoods will they live in? What will life be like for your grandchildren? You know, winning 4% means 96% is maybe not the way you want them to be. All of us can do something. Let me begin with parents. Parents, win your children to Christ. Do that. Um, I was a pastor for 20-something years, never, ever minded talking to any little one or teenager or anybody else, for that matter, but about how to become a Christian Wow, it would be so much better if you did it. Can I tell you that? You win your children to faith. If you want to bring them to me and say, see what he thinks or she thinks, that's another issue. But I would encourage you to do that yourself and and your, your, your grandchildren. Parents, you also need to serve in our youth ministry. John Gabe, would you like to have every youth parent working in some, some way? Work, work with John. Work with the, the, the youth. Bring other teens to church. Mentor them spiritually. Do what you can. What about business people? People who are engaged in some sort of work out there, selling products and, and that kind of thing. You ever thought about donating something? Maybe you work at an office supply. Um, we could use some paper. We could use this, that, or the other contributing to that products funds to help finance the war we always hear about financing the war effort the war to win culture needs dollars too so if you're a business person or you work with a business person that you know to be a believer inquire now you may want to check church policies and things before you go out and say yeah hey I got us a truck Check on that first, but they can help too. Senior adults, if you want to forget about us. Now, be some grandparents for this generation of isolated teens. Pass along your wisdom. Pass along your character. Pass along to them your integrity. 
Let them know that those things are still important. Young adults, 25s and above, you can have an enormous impact on the lives of teens and younger adults who are only a few years your junior. And part of the way you can do that is by setting the pace, by setting an example. This church and all the others need to be hospitals for hurting young people. They need to be welcomed here. And they need to be treated, not just a number, not just have a classroom. They need to be treated in this place. And above all, and if you don't get this, you will not reach them. Above all, we have to work at understanding where they're coming from. And they're not coming from the same place you came from. Now, I'm going to be very careful before I say this. I'm going to look around. I don't, I don't see anybody doing this. So if I offend you by missing seeing you with whatever it was I was going to talk about, forgive me. I have noticed that a lot of kids today, young people, love to wear caps. And they wear those caps pretty much anywhere. Inside, outside, whatever it is, in the church, in the house, to bed. And my generation, take that cap off, boy! Yeah, that bugs me. But if you can't say it in a nice way, don't say it. Let them wear the stupid cap. It ain't going to hurt nothing. That's where they're coming from. They're coming from that different way of, of doing things. Teens are passionate. They're, they're energetic. And, and not only are they passionate about having fun, I'm convinced they're passionate about, passionate about having something in which they can believe. Why not give them the truth? Why not give them the truth? Paul presents that very argument here in our text. He says that he had something to believe in, and he called it the gospel of Jesus Christ. But from what we have been reading about this passage, he is not talking about, and again, hear this clearly, he is not talking about the bare-boned facts of the gospel. Jesus loves you, Jesus died on the cross, believe in him, and you'll be saved. Now, all of that is true, and all of that needs to be stated, but he's not talking about simplicity of the gospel. He says that he is involved, as the, the passage says, with reasoning and arguing with his listeners in an intense effort to tear down false barriers that had been constructed against the truth. You can't make somebody understand a lot about Jesus loves you and died on the cross for you if they've got 8,000 million bricks of falsehoods in front of them that have to be torn down. And you can't do it. Don't think you can. The weapons are spiritual. But you would be doing yourself, the church, the kingdom of God, and every young people, person and anything else a disservice if you don't know how to do that. Now, the, the technical word here for this is apologetics. It's being able to defend what you believe in and to tear down the walls that prevent you from getting to them. I would encourage you to read up on apologetics. Buy a book on apologetics. Have an apologetics class here at church sometime. It's very important. The word comes from apology. It's not that, oh, well, I apologize that I'm a Christian. No, apology is a defense. You're defending it before someone. So that's kind of what we're, what we're talking about here. Find some way to tear down the, the barriers. Or to, to put it more into the context of, of today, the, the barriers have been constructed by a culture of death. And I'm here to tell you that there's a life giver out there. 
And that's Jesus. So once again, practical ways to engage in the, the battle. John, I don't know if you want to do this or not. You can if you want. Start a battle cry group around here. I, you know, you don't have to call it that, but something that inspires people to want to get involved and have the plan, develop the plan, not, not go out there and start knocking on doors. That may not work. But a group to come together in this church to say, let's devise a plan to reach who we can. You're not going to reach everybody. I wish you could reach all the high school over there, but you can't. But you can reach some. Volunteer to help John. Volunteer. Reach out to students that you come in contact with and invite them to, to services and to, to studies. And remember, don't tell them to take the cap off if they walk in. Or you will chase them out immediately. They will leave. The results of the tragedy of 9-11 led us to focus largely and intently on the relentless pursuit of anyone who threatens our national security. And I like that. And yet, with all of the school shootings that have taken place since 9-11, some just a few months ago, I have seen no relentless pursuit from either political or religious leaders. They talk about gun control and stuff like that. And I don't know where you stand on it, and I'm not trying to get involved with that. There's no promise of retaliation. There's no action that have been taken against the terrorists. And I'm not referring to the perpetrators. The real offenders are the terrorists of decency that are loose in this country and that are putting all kinds of crap on your teenagers. And in our silence, we have allowed them to become stronger and more organized. Columbine, April 20th, 1999, was a national wake-up call to reach out to the millennial generation. And we woke up, hit the snooze, and rolled over and went back to sleep. And we did it again and again. It is not too late to reach the students in this area. They are our kids. They do not belong to South Sand. They do not belong to Austin. They are ours. Ours. And we must take the responsibility to find them, to love them, and to bring them to Jesus. Nobody else will do that. Nobody from Fredericksburg is going to drive down here and reach those kids but you. Nobody from Houston is going to drive over here and reach those kids for you. You have to do it. Who will say this morning, I'll do something. I will not just stand by while the world and the culture of indecency steals our children. Who will say that? I'm going to ask you to do some things in a minute. If you're one of those that's willing to be a part of this, when the invitation comes in a moment and we stand, you come down here and stand. And if you're a teenager or part of that millennial group, that 21 to 23, 24 years old, and you want to be a part of that group to say, I will stand up and I'll try to do something for my people, you come down here and stand as well. You say, well, is that going to do any good? Maybe. My impression of Baptist invitations that I've been given for 20 some odd years is it works for about an hour and a half or so and then you forget about it. That's what I never liked about revivals. Well, you get these revivals, get everybody revived for a week or two. But we're trying to have a serious battle cry here, one that'll last. So I'm going to say it this way. If you're just messing with us, don't come. If, if it's just kind of like, yeah, boy, that sounds good. Ooh, boy, my plate is full. Then don't come. But if you want to be a part of the battle cry and join John Gabe and these kids, youth, teenagers, young adults, to try to recapture that generation before they're totally gone, 
then the invitation is yours. Now, there may be some that say, I want to join the church. Okay, good. We'll take that too. I want to recommit my life. Yeah, we'll take. Maybe some want to be saved. We'll certainly take that. But the message this morning is aimed to try to get people to say, I want to be a part of the battle cry to capture that generation. I don't want to lose it. So that's the real thrust. Can we do that? Don't come unless you mean it. But if you mean it, come. Let's pray. We give you the time, Lord. We're captured with the brutality of our culture and how difficult it is, the insincerity, the indecency. And yet there are young people, young adults, men and women right here in this congregation who don't want to put up with that and will not. And I pray that this morning, if we take a stand, we will mean it. And we will not walk out of here without being in some way antagonized by the Spirit of God to make a difference.